and to all the men and women who risked their lives so that we could continue living in freedom, we thank you for your service. service here at CBC starting at 9 a.m. CBC Feed and Ministry will also be having a Thanksgiving lunch on Thanksgiving Day at First Baptist Church in Burlington City from 12 to 3 p.m. Please join our volunteers for prayer and service as we serve our homeless and hungry community in the rear basement. If you can volunteer, call 609-941-5311 or call the church office. The Sunday School Department is now collecting new warm knit hats for men and sleeping bags to be given to the Helping Hand Rescue Mission. Boxes are located in the lobby and by the Sunday School office. Thank you. Join us for Fuel for Courage Sunday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Join us for Bible study every Tuesday night. We will be in person, virtual, on YouTube and Zoom. That's all for our announcements. Let's get ready. No, never alone, no, never alone, he promised never to leave me, never to fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Speak to me and speak through me, Spirit of the living God. Fall new and fall fresh. I ask these things in the master of my in marvelous name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Lord, praise for Sasha. Amen. I invite you to turn with us to an Old Testament book, the book of Ezra. Ezra in the Old Testament. I'll give you a moment to find it because sometimes those books move around. It may not be in the place you left it the last time you looked. Amen. Book of Ezra.
while you're still looking there, I'll, I'll just introduce an idea to you. And that idea has to do with the presence of God and his way of manifesting himself to us. Um, research has proven that um, there's a need, the, the need for touch is essential in people's lives. That uh, touch is essential not only for a developmental, from a developmental standpoint, it's also important for physical and mental advantages that it provides for us. You know, when we, when we touch somebody, we see somebody uh, crying, we see somebody in anguish, we usually rub their back, we touch them. Uh, because what touching does is it, it quiets the brain in the time of stress. Uh, touch is essential. It's been proven that infants literally cannot live without touch. They, they need to be touched somebody. Skin to skin contact, uh, science has proven. From the first hour of birth, uh, that child, it regulates their temperature, it regulates their heartbeat. It, 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 from the first hour of birth, it helps them in their breathing. It helps even assuage the desire to cry or to cry out. Touch is important. Further, touch does not just benefit the infant, but it benefits the mother. Because it's in the mother touching the child, she receives relaxation hormones. And that it aids in the release of an oxytocin in her processes that she uses in her life. Touch deprivation is a negative health outcome whereby anxiety and depression and immune system disorders happen because there is no touch. But aren't you glad that God puts his hand on you and me? And in the midst of all that we're going through, just feeling the presence of God is beneficial to our lives as we are feeling better. And, and the, the science has found there's no better ways that science says to uh, help depression and to help this touch deprivation than either massage or therapy, even pets. But I want to suggest that the greatest relief from all of this is the touch of God. Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. Are you looking at it? Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 7, and I'm starting to read at verse 24. I'm reading from the King James Version today. Ezra 7, verse 24. Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou... Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach you them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which have put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and have extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. Here it is. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Our central thought is coming out of that last verse. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. I want to talk this morning from the subject, in God's hand. In God's hand. The Bible frequently uses um, a, a technique called anthropomorphism. It is where the Bible assigns human uh, descriptors to God, which it does to help us identify the God, to get a notion of God. You see, the Bible tells us that God has a face. May the face of the Lord shine upon you. The Bible tells us 
that God has feet. Uh, in fact, in Genesis, he was walking in the cool of the evening. The Bible tells us that God has legs to walk. But we know, John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And so as a spirit, he does not have physical hands. He does not have physical legs. These are anthropomorphisms. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16 says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, God says to the nation of Israel. I, I've written you, I've, I've signed you in my hands. Or Isaiah 41, 10, Be not dismayed, I will uphold you with the, my righteous right hand. So then what is the significance or why is it important that we understand the face of God and the hands of God. Well, the face of God is used to represent the presence of God, the very person of God. When we talk about the face of God, it gives us a sense that he's standing there with us face to face. The hands of God, on the other hand, speaks to God's power and his works. God does things, he does powerful things, he does mighty things, and the Bible says the best way I can help you understand it is with his hands. Uh, Psalm 89, verse 13, your arm is endowed with power, your hand is strong, your right hand exalted. And this is what he said, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. God is his right hand. That's why Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. The right hand of God shall be exalted. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hands. Now, I know some of us like to argue that, uh, I don't know why we say hands when it should be hand, but the Bible has places where it uses both hand and hands. Hand and hands. And whenever we see this hand of God, you never see it doing nothing. The hand of God is always moving and guiding and doing something that it is beneficial to man. God, uh, the hand of God. When you say the hand of God is directed to me, remember, remember when we were when we we had small little children, and we be you be in the store shopping, and you have their hand on you have your hand on their head, and you be doing all this other stuff with this hand, but this hand is on their little head, and and if they try to move that hand, pull up, just just pull the head back. You pull the head back, and they come and they y'all y'all know what I'm talking about. It, it's good to know that to that child that. His hand, my mama's hand, my daddy's hand is on me. And, and I, I, do, I do want to throw this in as I'm going through. Um, if the right things are not in their hearts, their heads will make them look in the wrong direction. So it's one thing to guide their heads, but what are you doing about their hearts? What are the things that we are putting in their hearts that's turning their heads away from God? When we're, going through, when we're going through difficult times or confusing times, it, it is really hard to understand, is God's hand really on me? When I'm going through sickness, when I'm going through uh, any kind of deprivation, where is God's hand in all of this? Well, beloved, I don't care how unenjoyable the circumstance may be, God's hand is never distant from us. His hand is always there. And the bad times, we look upon them as awful, but if we really look back, there's some things that we learned from those bad times that ought to be helping us right now. There's some lessons that God has taught us. There's some circumstances or situations he's brought us out of. So the question becomes is, as we look at the book of James, he says, Consider it all joy when you are brought into and encounter various trials. Nobody signs up for trials. Nobody. Not even you. Nobody says, God, I got an extra afternoon. Throw some trials my way. 
Nobody asks for trials. Nobody asks for tribulations. But they will come. And when they do come, we got a God who is on our side. So the question is, how can I better recognize the hand of God? How can I know that God's hand is in fact with me? Well, first of all, you and I must familiarize ourselves with God's word. The more we understand the Bible, the more we understand what is going on in the word of God, the more we understand how God sometimes allows some circumstances, step back, gives us some room, steps back in, pulls us back into place. God is always there. And, and, and for people who don't read the Bible on the regular, some people only read the Bible when they come to church. I, I know you're shocked. Only when they come to church do they read the Bible. How many times have you bought something and don't read the instructions on how to put it together? Anybody? You did it? Yeah. Um, and then at the end, you got nine more number six screws, seven washers, four little pegs, and the little round things you don't know what to do with because you didn't read the instructions. I uh, Recently, I put a, a cabinet together, and I uh, thought I was reading the instructions pretty good until I got it all done, and I couldn't get one of the handles on because I had put the inside piece inside, and now I can't get the screws to come through the other side. Somebody help me. Uh, so now I got this cabinet that's got a handle on this side, but no handle on this side. Maybe I should have taken more time to read the instructions carefully on how to put it together. That's the way we live life. We're not familiar with what the instruction manual says. And because of that, we don't know the hand of God. Secondly, we need to spend time in communication with God in prayer. I'm not just talking about Wednesday night for one hour on the telephone. I'm talking about every day. Pray when you get up in the morning. Pray in the middle of the day. Pray. Somebody come to mind. <clears throat> Lift them up in prayer. When we don't seek the wisdom of God in prayer, we won't know who God is and how he operates. Third is, we must trust God and not rebel against his guidance. How many of us insist upon things happening the way we want it to happen? Not, uh, wrong crowd. Uh, we, this is how, Lord, we want this to happen. And, and we, we have the audacity to say to God, why did you allow this to happen? Or, or we say to God, why must I do that that way? Or we say to God, isn't there something, another way, a better way to do this? Now, I want to share this. Relationally, it's not wrong to question God, relationally. I caution you, however, is to do not doubt the goodness of God while you're asking your questions. Don't let it come through where you're being disrespectful to what God is doing in your life. You may not like it, but it is God allowing it or helping you navigate through circumstances that come against you in order to he can claim the victory in what you're going through. The more we recognize the hand of God, the better we're able to follow his lead. Can I suggest to you that the reason why some of us can't follow God is we didn't even know how to follow our own earthly parents. We, 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 we don't even know how to follow leadership, human leadership. We know more than everybody else. And because they're not doing it what I want or the way I think it should go, then it creates some problems. Listen, the, the Bible is absolutely true. I know we quote this part of it. You reap what you sow. We quote that part. But don't forget the first part. God is not mocked. You, you go, we go through systems where we don't show respect to whom respect this should be showed or honor to whom honor is showed. It'll come back and get you sooner or later. If you, allow, if you allow your children to disrespect other older people, not speak to older people, let me tell you what's going to happen. There's going to come a day they're not going to respect you, nor will they come back to you for advice. 
because you train them how to disrespect. Listen, I remember growing up, if you were a child and an older person came into the room, you said hello first. And if not, somebody would grab you by the ear and say, say hello. And, and you, didn't ever, you never called a, an older person by their name. Hi, Bill. It was Mr. Bill. It was Miss Sue. It was Mr. Tom. Nobody ever called their mother and father by their friend. What happened? I'll tell you something. Unless you train them to have respect for systems and authorities, it's going to come back to get you. It was a sermon preached by Jonathan Edwards. The sermon was called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And in the sermon, Jonathan Edwards used Deuteronomy 32, 35 as his passage of scripture. In that text it says, and their foot shall slide in due time. We've got to understand that when we are messing with God and not allowing God to rule, our feet slip. And when our feet slip, you're headed for a fall. Summarily, he says, it is only the mercy of God that keeps people from falling into hell. It is only God's mercy. And he says in the, in the sermon, and God is absolutely free to withdraw that mercy at any moment. Anytime if God decides to take that mercy away, we're bound to run to hell. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his steadfastness that will not let us slip out of his hands. Edwards used um, some vivid illustrations of hell and perilousness. And in the sermon, the people were, were forced really to make a decision, am I going to live, give my life to God? Now, there are some people that says, I don't think it's right to scare people into trusting God. By any means necessary. If you have to scare them into trusting God, then let them be a scared follower of Christ. Get them to a place where they'll walk with God. Because until we can get people to understand the urgency of the horribleness of hell, hell is real. It's not just a bad word. Hell is a real place. We've got to get people to understand that hell is a horrible place. And there's, we've got to provide an urgency to leave the conditions where they are and start to walk with God. First Peter said to young Christians, 1 Peter 5, you get home, read it. Talk to, he's not talking to leaders. He's talking to young Christians. And he says to them, in fact, in 1 Peter 5, 5, he's quoting Proverbs 3, 34. He said to them, surely he, God, scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. When we learn how to humble ourselves, Brother Will did a presentation for the men yesterday on humility. When we learn how to humble ourselves, under the mighty hand of God, God does some wonderful things for us. So, so, so calendrically in our text, Ezra chapter 7. Ezra resides in that 50-year period between um, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and God sending him back with a contingent of people into the land. Y'all heard about it. I know you did. Israel went into captivity in Babylon. Y'all hear about it? We've been talking about it in Bible study for like the last 10 weeks. So Israel went into captivity in Babylon. 70 years they had to go down in Babylon. And God, in the 69th year, God brought them out. We ain't going to discuss the 70th year right today. God brings them out. And in bringing them out, they come back into their land. Listen, they rebuilt finally the temple. That took some time because they spent most of the time building their own houses. Y'all heard about that? They worked on their house. Their house was all fixed up, and God's house was jacked up. And so they, they, they finally finished God's house. Fifty years transpired. Ezra now comes back. Listen very carefully. They rebuilt the temple, but they didn't rebuild the walls. And they didn't rebuild the walls because the, the people were, were, were warned. The people of Persia were warned, don't let them build a wall. Because if they build a wall, they'll defy you when you come against them. Many of us, here we go, we come to church 
but we don't have the wall of protection of God around us. We need God's protection to make it every day. After the return, and, and there was a number of events happened during this time, study of history, world history, the, uh, Xerxes had gone into uh, Greece uh, in a campaign. Uh, there was the battles at Marathon. There was a the battle at Thermopylae and, and, and Marathon and Salamis. A so, number of things happened. Uh, uh, disorder had erupted inside of Persia. With all of that, God brings back Ezra. By the way, Ezra's name means help. We all need some Ezra. We all need some help. God brings help for them. And the text says he was a ready scribe. That is, he was somebody who was an expert in the law that pertained to the Mosaic law and civil law. He was an expert. He was a rabbi. He was a maven. He was a doctor. And God brings him in. And coming back, Xerxes gave a commission to Ezra to come back into the land. According to Josephus, that commission was based upon Ezra's reputation. Can I say this real quick? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> your reputation goes before you. There, there are some things about us that we think people don't know, that they do know, and our reputation goes in front of us. We ought to protect our reputations. It's valuable. Because once you lose it, it's hard to get it back where people will trust you again. His reputation of high quality caused the king of Persia to give him a commission to go. So he left Babylon on this important commission coming back into the land. The text in verse number 10, chapter 7, verse 10 of Ezra says, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of God. Y'all grab that? He didn't just go to Bible study. He got his heart ready to go to Bible study. You know, some of us come out, oh, okay, I ain't been out this month yet, so I guess I'll put one, one Tuesday in. You, you need to stay home. You, you need to come to Bible study because you prepared your heart to receive what God is offering so you can grow up in him. He prepared his heart to seek the law of God. He devoted himself to reforming himself as he brought reformation to the lives of others. And here's the joy of our lesson because he's giving this authority. He now comes back into the land. And with the commission, verse 27 is our text, he says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers in our text. That's a, that's a devout thanksgiving. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. It is, it is an acknowledgement of divine goodness. How when's the last time? I'm, I'm not talking about coming to church. When's the last time at home you just sat down and started to thank God for how good he's been to you? I, I'm saying sitting in your bedroom, putting your socks on. How many of y'all remember when we could put our socks on standing up on one leg? Anybody remember that? I don't, it's so long ago, I don't remember it. But uh, just stop for a moment. God, I want to thank you that this room I'm sitting in right now, God, you're the one that gave it to me. You're the one that made it possible, Lord, that I'm living at this address with the conditions that they are. Just thanking God. God, and I, God, I don't want to just thank you for stuff. I want to thank you that I'm as far along in my relationship as I am. I want to thank you for lifting me up and bringing me to a place where I trust you. He says, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. Why was he blessing God? Why was he worshiping and praising God? Here's it right here in the text, verse 24, chapter 7, verse 24. You're looking? Because the earthly king had shown him favor. Y'all got to get this. A lot of the good things that's happening in your life, the favor you're receiving at your job, the positions that you hold, the, the, the advancements that have been made, you have those because God put in somebody's heart to show you favor. 
I've worked in circumstances where I knew people didn't want me to have the position that I had, but I knew they couldn't do anything about it because God put it in their heart that I would receive favor. The king had shown favor, had given a royal sanction for the establishment of the divine law. When you and I walk according to the ways of God, people will see God in, with, and in through us. And some people will get angry and attack us, talk about us, and other people will appreciate the fact that you're present there, and without you, it would fail. Ezra was given the right, first of all, in the text. The king showed him favor. Secondly, he was given the right to appoint magistrates and judges. You see the power of God? Here is Ezra with the ability to appoint leaders in a, for a country only because he trusts in God. He was given that right, and he, would have, he wouldn't have to contend with judicial opposition because he appointed those judicial magistrates to serve. Thirdly, since he's operating under the aegis of, of, of Persia, he would come into this position in such a way that he would set up officials, a dual set of officials, one set for the law of God, another set for the law of Persia. When God gives us favor, we can act like we're saved. We can do safe things. We can talk safe people talk. We don't have to engage in what other people do. This is the wrong church. When God gives us favor, when the enemy tries to bring us and pull us into what they're doing. You, you ever been in a work environment where they want to talk, they want you to come in on the dirty jokes? They, they want you to come in on the foul occurrences going on. They, they want you to come in on when they see a lady walking down the hallway making comments like they're making. Anybody here ever been there? And, and you stood your ground and you just turned around and walked away or you didn't say anything, you didn't join in the conversation. Glory to God that you exemplify that you're not of their lifestyle. So since Ezra's operating under this power of Persia, he says, Lord, what do you want me to say? God says, look, I'm going to give you authority. You can even enact capital punishment. If they don't do right, they die. Corporal punishment, they're punished, they're beaten. Or you can confiscate their goods. God gives authority under Ezra in this land. Now watch this. Since God has blessed me, since God's hand has been upon me, I think I ought to bless God. I think God deserves the blessings of his people. I think. I think that you got something to thank God for. So Ezra starts to bless God. Listen to what he says. God, you put this plan in the king's heart. He didn't think of this by himself. You're the one that put this in his heart to beautify your house. Oh, bless you, God. He, he says, he says, for extending mercy, verse number 26, extending mercy to me before the king and before the counselors. God, I bless you. For, for placing your hand on me and strengthening me. I love that verse because that says that whenever I'm about to fall down, God knows how to hold me up. God strengthens me. You place your hand on me. I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord was upon me. You know, sometimes we like to, we like to make this spooky and uh, say God put his hand on me. <sighs> no, 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 it, it, ain't, it ain't that crazy. No, I'm talking about just feeling the hand of God on your shoulder and saying, come on, son, you can do this. That no, I don't care who's coming against you. You stand strong in my name. For placing his hand on me and strengthening me. The word strengthen here is a Hebrew word that means to repair. I was weakened, but God repaired me. It's a word that means to help to prevail. I would have lost my mind if God had not stepped in. 
is a word that means to harden for the assignment. It's a word that means to, to, to be encouraged and made courageous for the things that God has. Yep, so, you know, somebody, sometimes when people look at us and they say, boy, he, get, he's, he's, he seems like he's a little cocky. No, that's not cocky. That's, that's called Christian courage. I got courage to know that God is standing with me. God's mighty hand might be an anthropomorphism, but it speaks to the strength of God and how he uses his hand to guide us. Two conjoined thoughts we see in the Bible, and it's repeated. Two conjoined thoughts. One of them, in fact, one of them appears 17 times. And that is the outstretched arm of God and the hand of God. God does not just have a hand. God has an outstretched arm. He's engaging his arm. And at the end of his arm is his mighty hand. And as the mighty hand of God is moving, God has sovereign involvement in the things that his children are going through. You ever, you ever go to a doctor, and the doctor says, uh, I was talking to one of our sisters, a great sister singer, and she was saying that she, the doctor told her that they believe they saw infection down in the bone in her leg, and they may have to amputate. And, and the sister said, uh, well, I'm going to have to make a phone call. And the doctor says, we don't have time for you to make a phone call. We, we, we've got it. we need an answer right now. She says, excuse me. Hey, God, is this the way I'm going out? He says, well, well, let us do this one more test. He went back and did another test and came back and says, it was a shadow. It wasn't an infection at all. Don't tell me. God can't do it. At the end of his outstretched arm, is his mighty hand. And by his hand, he's leading us, he's guiding us. So well, wait a minute, if the hand of God is upon me, then how can God's hand stretch out to bring judgment? Let me see if I can help you with that. I got this dog, and sometimes he decides he wants to eat stuff that he shouldn't be eating. Shoes stuff like that. And so he knows when he's wrong because when I go to approach him, he takes both paws and put over his nose because he knows I'm going to work on that nose. But this same hand that would have worked on his nose, there's some days I come home and he'll sit down and he'll look back over his head and he wants his hand to just touch him on his head. This same hand that once had judgment, the same hand has sensitivity. That's God with us. The same hand that corrects us is the same hand that leads us and guides us and holds us. That same hand. That hand which was once a hand of judgment is a hand of justice. That same hand that you are looking for in a time of trouble is that hand that soothes you and controls you. Um, I went to this um, gala last night for Pastor Morgan and uh, while I was standing there uh, this lady came up and she rubbed her hand on the back of my head. My first response was, that ain't familiar. <laughs> because you know what a familiar touch is. You, you know what it's like when God has his hands on you. You, you know it. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't, don't do that. No, don't stop that. Don't start nothing. Won't be nothing. God's hand. When we find ourselves in God's hand. I don't care how weak you are. I don't care how lost you are. God will find you. I used to see in the stores where little kids would run off from their parents. And then I started seeing little kids with little belts around their stomachs. And these little harnesses, if you will, and leashes on the little kids. So that if they tried to get too far away, the parents could pull them back in. Aren't you glad that God holds the reins? 
in the night season, God holds the reins, and he knows how to pull us back into place. Whenever you get weak, whenever you get forlorn and don't know what to do, just call on God. Ask him to lead you. Ask him to guide you. Seek his direction in your life. When you, God's hand is upon you, you don't walk astray. You walk in his way because he's leading you. Stand to your feet. Your seat. I am weak and I need your strength and power to help me overcome my weakest hour. Let me through the darkness thy face to see. your hand on my head, God, and walk with me. If you're here today, yes. Deacon Deacon Esther standing down front. Come on, let the day be your day. Let this be your time. Let this be your moment. This is your time. Say, God, I want you to rule my life. Is there one? Is there one today? Not saved. And Jesus died for you. Rose on the third day. Let me walk. 
every day. school they sing all the verses so second verse says this help me tread help me tread in the path of right. righteousness righteousness be my aid be my aid when sin somebody here today, you're already saved. You're born again. You've been baptized, but your name is not on the roll in any particular church. And we're asking you to come on and cast your lots here with us at Christ Baptist Church. By letter, a Christian experience, why don't you come on with us today? We're glad when God lets somebody walk with us and serve with us and work with us. If you're here today, why don't you come? After some years ago, you moved away, you went to school, you job moved, but you're back in town now, and you want to come on back home. We're inviting you to come on, cast come your lots back with church. us. Come on, reassign yourself here in this work. Harvest is plentiful, labor is a few. Why don't you come today?
brother's parents are in North Carolina, both mother and father in the hospital. And he needs us to go before the Lord on their behalf. I mean, it's one thing he's praying, but he believes what the Bible says, that the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous avail of much. We got enough prayer power in this room to reach North Carolina. And I tell you what, I know it'll reach heaven. So let us pray. Gracious God, in the name of your son Jesus, we come before you now, Lord, on behalf of our brother, Lord, who believes in the power of prayer. He believes, God, that if we were just to lift a petition up to you, mother, the father, both hospitalized, that doctors attending to both of them, but God, his heart says, I trust you, God, to do something about their condition. Father, I'm asking for healing virtue right now in the name of your son, Jesus. I'm praying, oh, Father God, that any pains that they have will be moved aside immediately, God. Father, I'm not talking about medication. I'm talking about your healing power. Touch them right now in the name of your son, Jesus. And I thank you, God, for his courage. I thank you for his faith. I thank you for believing that our God can do the impossible. Our God can do more than any doctor can do. That you specialize, God, in conditions just like this. Touch them right now. Strengthen and encourage his heart. We ask these things in the master's mighty and marvelous name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Shout the victory. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for our gathering today. We thank you for your hand upon our lives. Thank you for leading and guiding us. And now, God, we ask you for your traveling mercies as we leave this place. Be with us in the further scenes of this day, God. We're praying, God, as we share the truth of who you are, that we'll tell the world, our God has his hand upon me, and he's guiding my life. Now to him was able to keep us from falling, and us fall from the throne exceeding joy. Only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. People say amen. amen. Don't forget, anchors meeting in the upper room. The anchor people in the upper room. Oh.